Hello, everyone, and welcome to CodeCast by STL Tech Talk, where we're going to bring you, our listeners, the content you want and need, instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming and technology. Uh, my name is JJ Hammond, and I am joined tonight by two coding experts. Up first, our guest for the show is a senior program manager on the web platforms and tools team at Microsoft working on the web developer experiences of Visual Studio. He has over a decade of experience in developing web applications on the Microsoft platform, which got him the honor of becoming both an ASP.NET MVP and ASP insider. He is also the creator of blogengine.net, web developer checklist, and web essentials, image optimi optimizer, excuse me, and voice commands for Visual Studio, the brilliant Mads Christensen. Hello, Mads, and welcome. Thank you so much for being on tonight's show. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, it's so much fun, man. You're, you're a cool guy. Like I said before the show, I really like the way you write, um, and hopefully I like the way you talk. No, I'm just messing with you. However, this show is not, would not be possible without my good friend and fellow co-host striving to bring development knowledge to the masses uh, throughout the Twin Cities and all over the country. Let's just face it. The amazing, our very own Gus Emery. Say hello, Gus. Hey, JJ. You look a little cold. Are you cold? <laughs> I am, I am. You know, uh, we're having some issues with the heater. You know oh, how no. we uh, how we live in this rural area. You know, I haven't went outside with my lumberjack beard and chopped down <laughs> some trees and threw it in the fireplace. But no, I, I'm I'm doing I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks that's for good. asking. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, that's good. And 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 Mads, the last time I saw you, you were a Mad Christensen. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully you're a lot happier tonight, and uh, all will go well. Yeah, yeah. They uh, they uh, forgot the S on my name. When was this? MVP Summit. MVP Summit. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Why not? Mad Christian. Cool. Yeah, well, thanks I, for joining I us. I love the name. I love the name. It's a really good name. Um, are you guys ready for a ta fa fa fantastic show? I hope you are because I know I am. Um, and go to this show's uh, site, uh, CodeCastSTL.com, to f uh, keep up on all of our past episodes or follow us on Twitter, hashtag CodeCast or at CodeCast. Cast STL. Um, also, we want to direct you to uh, send us feedback to contact at stltechtalk.com. Um, and I want to just take a moment to thank the sponsor of the show, Inertia Software, creating cutting-edge, highly scalable Microsoft technological solutions to the energy industry. InertiaSoftware.com. That's Inertia-Software.com. Uh, go check them out uh, to see what they can do for you. Also, uh, I know you guys are into programming, so uh, Tech Systems. If you want to, you know, advance your IT career, but you don't want to submit to 100 of, of online job boards in the hopes of finding your next job, your solution is simple. Go to Tech Systems, uh, is the leading IT staffing provider in the United States and is ready to be your career partner. Their goal is to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. So contact a local recruiter today at TechSystems.com backslash. St. Louis, that's S-T-L-O-U-I-S, -S, that's Tech Systems, T-E-K, systems.com backslash St. Louis. So without further ado, let's get to the reason why we're all here, and that's to talk with Mads. Hey, Mads, how's it going? What got you into technology? What was, what was your first experience with programming? And just give us your life story in 30 seconds. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I think it started way back when I was in, uh, was that when I was in college. Um, well, yeah, sort of. In Denmark, where I'm from, it's a little bit different. But so I was around like 18, 19, and uh, to take me through school, instead of um, working at like a grocery store or coffee shop, I uh, started importing wine. Nice. And, um, that was really good. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, at some point, I had to create a website because I wanted to sell this wine online. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started in publishing, Microsoft Publisher. That was my first introduction to web development. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a little scary back in the day too. It was, and I had no idea what I was doing. And you know how, you know, in Word, you save a, word, a file, and it's like, it's called .doc, or back then, right now, it's .docx. Right. And the publisher saves a file called .pub. Right. And I had no idea what I was doing, so I was uploading the .pub file to the web server. <laughs> nice. And, and nothing worked, and it was very mysterious. I but, laugh because I've done that. No. Um. <laughs> I can understand it wholeheartedly. Yeah. So, so that was my first yeah. web development. I started a little bit before then doing uh, macros, like pretty advanced VBA stuff for Excel. Oh. Um, but that was more of 
I don't know. It wasn't. It was just a side thing. It wasn't really something I wanted to do full time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, pro programming. I mean, but then with the web and everything, it, it kind of just started from there. And then, you know, back in the day, it was easy, right? It was, it was HTML. It was uh, some table tags, some uh, font tags, and uh, then go to dynamicdrive.com and find some JavaScript that would do something and put it on your page and get an animated GIF and done with it, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Or a counter. You had to have the counter too. Oh yeah, stat counter. Not, I was a big fan of stat counter back then. I actually wrote my own uh, uh, analytics. Uh, this was before Google Analytics really was a was thing. Yeah. Wow. In classic cool, AFP. Yeah. yeah. So what pushed you to that? Was it was it just um, what was it your continued just kind of success doing what you were doing? I mean, did you have some failures? I mean, tell us a little bit about that that particular journey. Yeah, I think I don't think my story is uh, different than anyone else's. Uh, that kind of started from scratch. I, oh, okay. Coming from college uh, with a CS degree uh, might be different. I'm not sure. I, I I don't have a CS degree or anything. So, but um, like you start and you fail and you fail and you fail and then suddenly something works, right? And success, something worked. Well, I can and, tell you in college they don't teach you anything either. So. <laughs> well, so so you get to the point, right? Where right. now you succeed. That something worked. And right. you kind of forget about the failures that you've had for the past week, where you were—it was the most frustrating week of your life—and right. you forget all that. Right. And it's totally worth it. So, uh, so it just takes a while, and then at some point, and I remember this very clearly. There was a point. This was like years in. Um, I came to the realization that I could build anything—not that I necessarily knew how to do it, but I knew how to go online and search for help and figure it out on my own. You know? Right. Right. Um, yep. And I remember that very distinctly as as being wow. Now now I'm a programmer, you know? right? Yeah, I make things. That no that that's really cool. Just because um a lot of people get hung up in and they get stuck, right? They kind of get in idle mode. And um there's it, it takes it takes a little bit more to say I want to do this. And I, I just I always I always kind of ask just because I'm I guess I'm just because I'm curious because if because this information is always, it's at all of our fingertips. I mean, the same information that was available to you is available to me and everybody else and whatever, whatever, whatever your circumstance. I mean, you can find it. What, per, you know, what pushes one to pursue that sort of stuff? So that's why I was kind of curious about. So what le what brought you to Microsoft? Was it using their uh, tools in order to get where you wanted to go? Or, or tell us a little bit about that. I think for me, <clears throat> for me, that has always been not the... Uh, the love of programming, or you know, the love of code that kept me coding. It was coding for me was a means to an end, right? I had an idea and I wanted it realized, and the way to get from brain to working thing, right? Was programming, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I love programming, but it was not that was not my main motivator, and so I always kind of went for uh, ideas and and then realizing them, and they became products. And BlockEngine.net came. Came out in 2006 or seven or something like that, which became very quickly the largest um, block platform on .NET. And so it was actually through there that I got the MVP award, um, and I met some Microsoft people. And one day there was a there was a tweet in my Twitter inbox saying, "Hey, have you seen this uh, job thing? Right, um, post up on Microsoft careers." And I looked at it and said, I had not, so let me try apply for that. Yeah. And sure. it took five days for, and I was in Copenhagen, Denmark at this time, and, and I think it took five days for the, they contacted me till I had gone through the interviews all on Skype, till I quit my job <laughs> and, and signed the contract with Microsoft. Oh, That's wow. Cool. That sucks. It was really quick, yeah. Yeah. So you so so what was so the transition was that kind of fun? Like, hey guys, I'll see you later. I'm going to the U.S. for a little while. Oh yeah, uh, threw a large party, and then I left. Oh nice, <laughs> nice. Just a large That's, party, not a huge party. Well, yeah, 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 yeah right. Semi huge. You're up, wow. Gus. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, so, uh, so t tell us a little bit about what you're working on at Microsoft. I mean, um, I, I know you've done, we uh, you know, um, Web Essentials and some other things, but wh what, you, uh, what else are you working on? Yeah, so I'm the, the program manager for different types of features in Visual Studio. All of them are in Visual Studio. Uh, okay. 
So, so we are the team that has both the ASP.NET framework itself and also the web tooling in Visual Studio. And I'm on the Visual Studio side of the hallway. I'm not on the framework and runtime side. Okay. So the stuff I work on are the like general web tooling, and mm -hmm. so that um, so it's me and then another program manager called Sayed Hashimi. We are uh, we're kind of splitting the work in half, and so my responsibilities are all the editors. Okay. We have seven of them. We're the team with by far the most uh, editors in Visual Studio. We got CSS, Less, SAS, CoffeeScript, JSON, HTML, and web forms. That's seven editors. Wow. Yeah. And so that's all my team that, that builds all those. Uh, then we have uh, Page Inspector. We have BrowserLink. Um, and then we have all this new tooling for Grunt and Bower and NPM that's coming out in Studio 2015. So that's all, that's all my team. Uh, the other side of the things uh, that Syed is responsible for are stuff like the project system uh, and publishing and, uh, you know, scaffolding and file new, the file new experiences and all that. Um, okay, why don't you just uh, describe um, Grunt and Bower and, and those types of tools, and why don't you give us kind of an overview of what these are and what, what they uh, garner for the developer using them. Yeah, I think we should take a step back maybe and say okay. why, why do we even care, right? What, right. right. So, <clears throat> so we have some issues today um, in, as a web developer with our workflow. And when you consider things that every web app does or should do, Maybe I don't know. <laughs> but right. Stuff like uh, bundling and minification of CSS files and JavaScript files. Yep. Um, if you want to do less or SAS, you know, you want to compile that. You might want to run some other preprocessors that auto prefix your vendor specific CSS properties, so you don't have to deal with like a, a browser, uh, different browsers and so on. Um, there's a lot of things in our workflow that would be helpful. And today, to do bundling and minification, there's like a lot of different ways. We can do it at runtime, we can do it at build time, we can do it at design time. And that's where Web Essentials have come in and, and been really good at sort of making it easy to, to do all these more advanced things at design time. So it works when you're in Visual Studio building your app. And um, there are some fundamental issues with that approach. Um, the biggest one is that it only works in Visual Studio. It doesn't work through MS Build. It doesn't work on a CI server or build server, or if you use AppVayer.com or Travis or you know some cloud-hosted build servers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work. You need Visual, uh, Visual Studio with Web Essentials. Mm -hmm. And so what it means is that if you're if you're a team with multiple different versions of Visual Studio, or maybe someone actually prefers to sit in Sublime Text, you know they don't have the same features, and therefore you can't collaborate on the same project, and that's really problematic, especially. Right. Um, as we look at ASP.NET 5, which is in beta right now, which is cross-platform, so it, it even runs on a Mac. Right? We have we have tooling in Sublime and Vim and Atom and brackets and and uh, for building ASP.NET apps. So I mean, we can no longer rely on Visual Studio and uh, a specific version of Visual Studio with Web Essentials and a specific version of Web Essentials. Right. Support, right. That workflow is is no longer uh, good. So. Um, Grunt and, and Gulp as well, so there are two uh, competing, and they're both excellent. I like them both. Um, they they kind of solve that problem, and um, they have been solving that problem for years. It's just been that they are, they, those tools have not been, how can I say it, like... Uh, forefront, maybe? In, uh, no, more like they haven't been accessible in a Visual Studio way. Uh, so gotcha. Think about gotcha. what Visual Studio do, or does, and what the, the Visual Studio users expect from Visual Studio. It's, it's not that you have to go to the command line. It is not that you have to do all sorts of weird things, unless it's a first class kind of feeling inside the IDE. Mm -hmm. The typical Visual Studio user might not uh, find it that interesting. Furthermore, those tools actually do not run on .NET or Win32 or something. They run on Node, Node.js. And so does that mean that now you have to do Node.js and have to learn that and NPM? And uh, what about ASP.NET? If I want to do if I want to do ASP.NET, does it what if can I then have Node and would you know should I just write Node apps, web apps, or you know, how how does all this work? And so um, there's been a lot of confusion. And so the idea that we've had is in order to solve these issues, we have to take 
the tools that exist out there that sort of the internet decided was the right tools. And you know, Grunt and Gulp are one of some of them. Um, with a huge ecosystem of plugins, articles, tutorials, help. Uh, right, right. Because we all, I, I need that. I yeah. need that. So everyone does, right? I mean, everyone does search-driven development these days, anyway. So it's super important that the ecosystem is solid. And uh, so the internet decided that was those were good things. And so what we've tried to do is to say, okay, let's embrace it. Let's not try to invent our own. Uh, ways of bundling and modifying and compiling lists and SAS and all this sort of stuff. Right. That let's embrace the ecosystem, but let's build it into Visual Studio in a way that is first class for a Visual Studio developer. Right. That makes sense in the workflow, right? Because that's what we that's what you would want. Oh yeah. definitely. Yeah, that's that's been super important. And it's been it's actually it's so important that uh, both that you have the first class Visual Studio experience, but also that the way that those tools work from the command line, which they are, right? If you sit in Sublime Text on a Mac, you would use the command line to control all these tools. Um, and we have to make sure that it's the exact same tools that Visual Studio run without modifying any configuration, anything else. The exact same project that you cloned from GitHub that was originally developed in Sublime Text on a Mac, well, that should just light up and work in Visual Studio as if, as if it was created in Visual Studio, right? Nice. Um, so that was, the, that was the intent, and also, if you prefer to sit in the command line, by all means, do that. It's the exact same thing Visual Studio is doing that you're doing from the command line as well. So Visual Studio is actually just acting as a proxy between uh, the user and the command line tools. And that's really, really important to stress, because that means that you can update all these components individually um, without having to wait for an update from Visual Studio or anything like that. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. So it's, it's literally because... It's not because we say, oh, everyone talks about grunt and gulp, and so we want to be cool as well. That is not the point. The point right. is that we have, we have some workflows that can best be solved using these tools, and yes. we want to embrace them because of that. I want to plug people to your to your uh, your your blog. It's and and I've said this before the show. It's an amazing. If you like reading, just in general, everybody go check out it. It's his name. It's just his name. Dot net. Uh, MadsChristensen.net, and we'll have that on the uh, on the show page and the site and all that stuff to redirect redirect you. But you do just a phenomenal job, kind of explaining this stuff. But go ahead, uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but I just I really wanted to make sure people go to your your site, man, and follow you because you you do a really good job. Thank you. I don't write too long though, so it's important to know. I don't. I hate I hate long reads. So right. Just, just right. Right. Yeah. Well, because no one has an attention span past a certain point. So, like, yeah. if I have to scroll up, then you lost me. Not me, but I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't mind scrolling up. But I'm saying other people don't want to scroll up. If you understand what I'm saying. Sure. So you were saying. Well, that's basically it, right? So that's that sort of. So that's the two two aspects of it is the grunt and gulp, which are task runners. Right. Just like game is built, but for the client side uh, assets that we have in our project. And I think we should preface this a little bit by saying that it's it this is jo this is manipulation on on Java, JavaScript for the most part. Yep. You know. Well, you configure these tools in JavaScript, right? Right. So just right. JavaScript, and you know MS Build you configure things in XML. Right. And um, yeah, I it, the, the JavaScript approach is so much nicer, so much. Mm -hmm. nicer. Mm -hmm. And there's like you said, there's a lot of documentation to support that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we're working hard on getting the tooling. So good, and I have some new prototypes that I, I want to show you today. That yeah, like, cool. <laughs> that way, just uh, that I just kind of, I'm not finished with them, but I got them in a state now where they're really interesting. So um, uh, I'm, I'm super good. stoked. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm I'm ready to roll whenever you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Well, shall we dive into Visual yep. Studio? Let's Let, dive. Let's do it, man. Let's awesome. dive. I'm ready. All right. Let's see if I can share the screen here. All right. So, can you see? Yep, yes. it's up. All right. So <clears throat> let me just uh, give you like a quick overview here of uh, uh, an ASP.NET 5 application. So what I've done is I've, I've gone in and said, file new project, ASP.NET 5. ASP.NET 5 is this new version of ASP.NET that's out in beta. And it looks like this. Um, it looks a little bit different. Uh, one thing that's new is this dependencies node. And if we open it, we can see we have two new concepts in here. These are first-time concepts in Visual Studio. And um, if we look at Bower, we can see that I have a few packages. And Bower 
let's back up here. Bower is like NuGet. Think of NuGet, but for client-side packages such as CSS library, uh, CSS frameworks, and JavaScript libraries, and so on. So here you can see we have Bootstrap, that CSS file, and we have jQuery and some more jQuery files here. Um, but these are packages. They're not. They're not actual files. We're looking at. We're looking at dependency mm -hmm. graph, which is super nice because. Um, for what we're doing here with Bower, Bower brings in a lot of different files, and we just need to know sort of how they're laid out and their dependencies. And then we're going to move those files around a little bit later. But Bower is basically NuGet, but for client-side packages. So one of the really important things have been <clears throat> that, you know, pick your JavaScript library of the day, right? There's new ones coming out all the time. Guess what? They're not on NuGet uh, to begin with. The, the first thing that happens is that they're going to end up on Bower or on NPM as we have just below it right here. That's where sort of the ecosystem puts these things, uh, not in NuGet. That's sort of .NET people only that uses the, uh, NuGet. Yep. So by integrating Bower and NPM, we actually open the door for a lot more libraries than we've had before, which is really good. So Bower is exactly that. It's for client-side packages. Um, and NPM, that's where we keep the tooling. So if we look at NPM, we can see we have grunt, we have a grunt bower task, and we have a grunt contrib less task. But these are node modules. And we can do the same thing. We can open the dependency graph here, and we can see all the dependencies they've got. And it's sort of just a logical view, like for bower. Really nice. And so what we're doing is that we're controlling bower and NPM through their JSON files. So Bower has a file called Bower.json, and NPM has package.json. So this is just like NuGet, right? You, for NuGet, you had, um, uh, what's it called? You had the packages.config. And Bower is the exact same thing, Bower.json. So let's say I want to install AngularJS. I can just go into my Bower file. Notice here how we have this little icon showing up down here. Uh, so we know it's Bower. This is the Bower logo. So that makes it really easy to see that this is, uh, in fact, a Bower file because JSON files tend to look alike, you know? Yeah, for, for our audio listeners, it, it, it's it's a parrot, a red-headed parrot. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. But uh, you you will not miss it on the screen. Let's just say that. No, no. That's huge. Yeah, I like exactly. it. <laughs> you can turn it off, of course, but it's a, I like no, it. Why would you? I mean, yeah, that's well. just that's just fun. I mean, it's let's like be honest. It's like being a pirate and having a parrot on your shoulder. You yeah, right. <laughs> right. So anyway, <clears throat> I have here my dependencies node. And dependencies, you know, I can just hover it and see what the description is of all these different fields that I have right here. Of course, I get full, full IntelliSense for the entire file here because of the new JSON editor um, supports JSON schema. So that's really nice. So we have schemas for all this stuff. Uh, it's all online and open source. Let's say I wanted to install Angular. I can just go here under my dependencies node and type Angular. And notice here how we get full IntelliSense. This is IntelliSense for every single package available on Bower. Right? So that's really important. And we even get the version number here. So we can say, hey, install Angular, or I want, to, I want Angular version 1.3.7. And then all I have to do, like I save my file, so now we can see that Angular shows up here, but it's not installed. So I can use this smart tag and say install package. And if we look in the output window, we can see that it's doing that. I think it might already be done. There it is. And as soon as this is done, you can see here, Angular is now ready to use. So that's super easy. Uh, what we're going to do in the next release, remember uh, Visual Studio 2015 that I have here is only in preview, right? It's not done yet. Uh, right. So for the next release, we're going to have all this happen, uh, all this uh, installing. It's going to happen automatically when you just save the file, right? So you don't have to do smart tags. You don't have to right click. It just works. And so that's really cool. That is cool. cool. Yes. So that now, really cool. if we open uh, our project here, we can see that Bower components. See, these are the two files that are folders that we do not show in Solution Explorer. But this is where uh, NPM and Bower puts their files. So Bower puts them in Bower components. And you can see we now have Angular. And looking at that, we get a lot of files. And you probably don't care about most of these files. You just want Angular, right? 
Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to move the files that we need into our project. And of course, we do not want to do this manually. So let's uh, look at Grunt. So Grunt is imported here through my package JSON, so that's npm. Right? Grunt is on my task runner. And I have it right here. The tools have been brought in. Notice these are developer dependencies. Now what this means is that none of this is part of my app, right? It's just this is my tool chain. So I can version my tool chain for this specific project different than for many other projects. So depending on the different versions of the tools, um, because there could be a breaking change with the later version, and I don't want that for this particular project, then I can version that, which means that my project will just keep on working, uh, regardless of what uh, updates that might be out there, which is really nice. So I bring in Grunt, and that gives me the Grunt file. And this is what it looks like. It's just JavaScript. And you can see here how um, I can define tasks. So um, this is my configuration. I'm loading my Grunt Bower task because I want to move my Bower files now. So if I can execute the Bower install target right here, mm -hmm. that means that everything will now be moved into dot root slash lib. So that's the folder we have here under lib. You see here there's no Angular here, right? Right. And so to execute that, we can go and do, let's just refresh the task runner explorer that we have right here. You can see I have my Bower task with the install target. You see it matches completely what I have in my file. And I can simply just click it. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Right? And it will run the Bower uh, install. And now you see Angular shows up over here. I didn't have to refresh anything. It just shows up. And look at this. It's only the angular.js file. Nothing else. So, yeah. <laughs> now that's cool. So what this task does is that it also brings in all the packages if they weren't there. So what's really cool is that uh, if I go here, I personally, I for my projects, I do not want to commit to source control, the Bower components, and node module. Right? It's a, it's a big uh, it's a big discussion. Right. Um, but you know that's my preference, and it's just the same. You don't commit your uh, your packages folder with your NuGet packages either, right? Right. So let's so let's say that that you clone a project from GitHub that does not have these two folders. Well, Visual Studio, if you run this task, will just install all the packages and copy them to the right location, right? So you get this very nice workflow, um, and you can set this up to happen automatically. So that's really really nice. And so um, that's how Bower works. That's how we can install all these packages. We simply just use the IntelliSense here to get uh, the packages that we need. And yeah, if I hover them, you can see here I get a little extra information. Really nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Now check this out. Then. You get a little extra information here. Oh, stop. Now you're yeah. stupid. That's gorgeous. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. And so um, so the idea here is that the the way you interface with Grunt and Bower, oh, sorry, with Bower and NPM, as your, these are package managers, right? NPM mm -hmm. means node package manager. Um, the way you interface with them are exactly the same, and they're going to be even more the same as the project.json, which is the um, sort of the ASP.NET 5 uh, manifest file or configuration file, if you will. Right. Uh, they're all going to work the exact same way, so it's, it's important to notice here that the it, we're really talking first-class citizens when it comes to NPM and power. And also Grunt, because this Task Runner Explorer is really nice. It lets us execute all these things in a, in a super cool way uh, without ever having to go to the command line. So, so far, I've been installing Bower packages. I've been able to run Grunt tasks, and I have not yet been on the command line, right? It's just, it just happened in here in Visual Studio. Um, so that's nice. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, some of the stuff that Web Essentials have been doing has been stuff like compiling... Uh, less files into CSS. And so with a new version of Web Essentials, we no longer have uh, those compilers in Web Essentials. Web Essentials sort of loses the capability of compiling less into CSS. And that's, that's completely on purpose. Um, there are several different reasons why uh, I've stripped out those features from Web Essentials. Um, one of them is that it is not very flexible. The, 
the compilers, we could not, through just right-click menus to compile, uh, you know, you can right-click a list file and say compile to CSS. Like, that level of, um, those sort of gestures where it's just, you just click a button and then that's it. Uh, it's not very configurable, it's not very flexible, and it, it's very limited. So what we really want is to start using something else, something that actually gives us the flexibility. So I get a lot of bug reports and suggestions for Web Essentials for, oh, can we, you know, for some power, or sorry, for some less files in my project, can we do, uh, not add it to the project, but, you know, compile it to a different location, uh, you know, but only for that one file. The other files should have a different... <laughs> And that's totally normal, right? right. And, um, uh, but, you know, we can't do that through Web Essentials. You need, you need a lot more fidelity and granularity in the way you set up things. So um, let's take a look at what that would actually look like if I were to uh, use Grunt to uh, compile my less files. So you can see here I already have installed the package, Grunt Contrib Less. So now I'll just go into my Grunt file, and I can... Uh, here you get full intelligence for Grunt. Uh, so that is that is very very new. Uh, I basically did that the last couple of days. I know uh, it's that it was so neat watching you do that. Um, you, you, uh, for our listeners, you, he has uh, embedded that into that uh, blog, his site. Uh, it's really cool stuff. Yeah. But then check this out. No. Uh, you get intelligence directly from the package.json file for the nice. Well, we can simply do this. So that means now we've loaded the less task. And then I've cheated. <laughs> oh. Come on. There we go. Who, and, who wouldn't cheat? Yeah, Just exactly. Cheat. So now we have a less task. So this one corresponds with the less file I just uh, loaded, or the less task I just loaded. It looks for an uh, object called less, and that's what I'm defining here. I'm creating two targets. And I can invoke these independently. So my dev target is, you know, my development target. When I'm developing my app, I want my less file, which is loaded, located here, site.less. I want that to be compiled into root CSS site.less. So this file, basically. Oh, very um, cool. Yep. And then I want to say, hey, turn on source map. So I want to, I want this to happen when I'm in a development. So let's just uh, refresh here. Oh, and by the way, also the manual refresh step is going to go away. It's just going to happen every time you update the grunt file. Oh, uh, that's gonna, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's uh, run the dev target. You can see it's done. Now Visual Studio pops up and says, hey, do you want to reload site.css? Because it's open over here. I said yes. And now we can see we have everything here, including source mapping. Right, so if you want to use Chrome Developer Tools or F12 tools in, in IE um, that support source map, then you have you have support for it right here. Nice, <clears throat> and uh, that is that is super cool. And um, you know when we're in production, I do not want the source map, uh, right. and I so I I don't specify that option. But instead, what I do here is that I put uh, clean CSS in here. That means uh, you know minify and and so on. So if I run the production target, then it looks like this, right? Minified, one line, super easy. Um, and that's cool, but the problem is I don't want to run this every time. You know, I don't want to manually uh, run this. What I want is that whenever I, I'm in my site.less file and I save it, I want it to update, uh, automatically compile into CSS. Hmm. So let's just take a look at what this file does here. It's basically just a plain CSS file, uh, but it does have a, uh, it imports the variables.less file, which is right here, which does not do anything except it defines a variable. And that variable is uh, referenced right here. And of course, by the way, you do get intelligence for, uh, for this sort of stuff in Visual Studio, which is kind of nice. Um, but that's sort of what it does. So I want to make sure that whenever I change any of these files, the, the less compiler should compile it into my site.css, which is loaded in my website, right? Right. So to do that, I go back into my package.json. Remember, package.json is where we install tooling. Mm. And, and then I want to say grunt contrib.watch. I want to install a watch task. 
And basically what that does is that it's, it's literally a file system watch that uh, will pick up on changes. Oh, OK. And then can fire off tasks. But let's just uh, get this. Uh, See, the problem was that I did not actually install this. We're going to do that right there. So now we should see it's not installed. It's installing right now. It will be done in a second. While that is running, let's look at configuring the, the watch task. Now, this is super simple. So I'm configuring it here. I'm giving it a name. I'm just going to give it the name less. It could be anything I want it. Oh, okay. Then I'm going to say every time a less file, dot less file, inside my less folder changes, then run the less task with the dev target. So this is task target, okay? Um, That's really cool. Let me just save that. Refresh. And now we can kick off watch. So now it's watching. As you can see here down here, it just says waiting, right? Waiting. It's always yeah. running. And um, let's just pin this. So if I go into my variables less file, and let's change this to, I don't know, 50. I'm going to save. You can see that it now runs down here, and it's already done. And my site CSS has now been uh, updated. Wow. It's 50, right? So we get the exact same behavior, but we get uh, like the full fidelity uh, granularity of all the various settings that we want to put on these different tasks, which is super cool, right? We get we get so much flexibility. We can target this uh, very, very specifically to our needs. So this is new. Like Visual Studio uh, rarely has features that are uh, this, uh, this high fidelity. And so um, that's why we love having Grunt and Gulp in Visual Studio, because it gives us that sort of for the first time. Uh, and then, you know, as I said, I can do all this just here. Um, no command line is needed. And, right. uh, the thing is, with less, you or sorry, with less, with uh, with uh, running this watch task, what you probably want is not to go in here and start it manually by clicking it. Right. What you probably want is to start the watch task by assigning a binding. We can say when the project opens. So let me do that again. I can right-click any task or target and say, hey, run this every time the project opens. Wow, that's cool. So now when we look at the bindings, we can see project open, grunt file runs. Right? Um, pretty nice, pretty nice. Um, and that's exactly what we want. Uh, another thing we can do, which is something that I always do because I really like this, is I'm registering a custom task here. And I'm going to call this, uh, let's just call this production. Let's say I want to be able to very fast put my website into a production state so I can use it for testing, for instance. Oh, OK. Yeah. And I want to run my less task, and it's I want to run the uh, the prod target. Now I'm only doing less compilation here, but I might do bundling and minification and other things. And in that case, I can simply just chain them together like this. You know, maybe I have a uh, bundling that would be like a concat, and maybe I have a production target for that too, right? Uh, but in this case, I only have one thing, and so we can save that, and uh, let's just close these. So what I want to do now is I want to take my production and bind it to after build. Okay, so now my task here, which runs less prod, so now when I build Visual Studio, Control Shift B, okay. you can see that it now starts running in the bottom here, and now it compiled my less file into a production setting. So we see it right here. Now it's minified and, and all nice. And so I don't lose my muscle memory. It's the exact same thing as I'm used to. Um, this is super important because this is sort of what you expect from Visual Studio is that you don't have to maybe learn all those new concepts when you don't have to. Everything sort of seems natural, and you can keep your muscle memory. That's super important. Wow. So the, the, what I really hope uh, by showing this is that uh, letting everyone, all the viewers here, see that it is not complicated. Uh, and it's not scary. The Grunt and Gulp, uh, Bower and NPM integration is very, very simple. It's all configured through simple JavaScript. And a lot of it is just like object literals, right? It's just mm -hmm. sort of JSON. 
how you define what your configuration is for the different tasks. So uh, I really hope that you want to give it a chance. Um, even on Visual Studio 2013, you're, uh, there are great extensions that helps you. Uh, one of them is the Task Runner Explorer. So basically, this entire window down here where I ran all this is available for 2013 Visual Studio. And also, the IntelliSense that we saw show up here in, in PackageJSON and BowerJSON is also available in uh, something called Package IntelliSense, another Visual Studio extension. So if you're not on 2015 yet, go check out those two extensions and, uh, and start playing around with this. Um, I can really recommend it. It's really powerful, and I know that you're going to love it. Um, and I oh, hope this is, yeah, this is really, really cool. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. I know that for a lot of people, it's, well, it's the Node world. It's, I don't necessarily want to learn something new, but I think the learning curve here is very flat and easy to get going with. So um, please give it a go. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that it 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 it'll make I think that it makes people's lives a little easier, especially when it's um it's got IntelliSense in it, like you showed, uh, and it's 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 speaking to the future a little bit, and you can just man, you can knock out so many so so many small things much much faster. Um, yeah, and that's and really add, cool to watch. And also, beyond that, you can do some custom things that you simply could not do before, unless you really. Uh, did some crazy stuff in MS Build, which very few people know how to do with custom uh, targets in C Sharp and all that. Um, but I, I have an example. So I run this website called schemastore.org, which is a JSON schema. That's where we store all the JSON schemas that give us IntelliSense for all the JSON files in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I run unit tests. I have a lot of JSON files that I validate against their schema. And for that, I have a custom task where I manually go in and, and wrote some a little bit of Node. I had no idea how Node worked, but you know it's just JavaScript, so that part is I'm I'm familiar with that. And then it's just a matter of saying, okay, how does the file system API look like? Okay, you know, Google that, and, and you know it's not that scary. And now I have like a full workflow for something that I mean, no one else has this particular problem, probably, right? It's very unique to my situation. So this was simply just not possible before. So this is really cool. Yeah, it is really cool, and I think I think the the intelligence piece and and I think the the productivity piece that that uh, it, it brings individuals to do is is really cool. But uh, more specifically, I think that this will speak to that uh, ASP crowd a little bit m better uh, than than uh, other stuff does. And, oh, yeah. and, and <clears throat> Gulp, Gulp, Gulp is really interesting as well. I mean, it makes no um, you know make no mistake. I mean that that's. Uh, that is what it is. It's gulp, and it, even the little icon explaining what gulp is is a big, you know, drink, if you will. So yeah. it's uh, it's a big gulp, but um, it, it's it's really cool. Yeah, it's really it's really neat to to watch that stuff, and hopefully the viewers do take advantage of that because, uh, you know, th I think you even have. I want to say, let me just double check something real fast here. Um, it was for uh, grunt and gulp. IntelliSense and Web Essentials 2015, and then uh, just kind of your uh, year in review update. You talk about Visual St the road of your Visual Studio 2013. That's one of the things I was reading, and and just the uh, if, when people are using version 2013, you know, in the updates, and 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 when they move on to 15, um, that the that it's a that it's web tools uh, that that work really well. So it's just really cool uh, watching that. Yeah. So, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to uh, Go ahead and answer that one. I've got a question, too. Oh, I didn't know. Was it a question? It know. wasn't a question. It was oh, more okay. of a All right. So. So, so my question is, can, can you utilize, like, uh, Grunt, Bauer, and, and NPM and things like that to write your own custom, um, say, um, applications to fit into current websites? Um, uh, go ahead and uh, I mean, so... Let, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what, I, what you mean, but here's, here's how I look at it. So I'm an ASP.NET guy, right? I want to write ASP.NET. That's, those are the apps I want to build. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I don't even want to consider Node.js. I don't, I don't <laughs> really care, right? I, no, seriously, or PHP or, or Rails or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I played around with those frameworks uh, over the years, and, you know, I'm an ASP.NET guy, hands down. There's, yep. And I, that doesn't change because I want to add, because I, want, because I get jQuery JS or angular.js mm -hmm. from from something that runs on node behind the scene, right? How does that affect my app? How does that affect the app that the user is going to see? 
Well, the answer is that it doesn't. If anything, it's going to make it better because I get the latest version faster um, and all those things. So it's, it's only a benefit. Sure. And when we talk about Node uh, as part of the tool chain, um, think of it as Node being the portability layer. Right? The reason Node is, is great for these things is that it works on all platforms. And right. so, and so it's, the portability aspect here is just great. And then it has this big e ecosystem that's uh, uh, so great to finally be able to tap into in a first-class way. And um, I'm really, really excited for that. But, but don't mistake that the t because the, t the tooling that we use in, with Visual Studio to build ASP.NET apps, that any node code will end up in your app. They're completely separate. Interesting. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. What I really liked, and and, and uh, some of our audio listeners didn't get a chance to see, was the the different packaging, right? And and the information from that. I think that's going to be. I think that's a sleeper hit. I really do. I, I think that that's going to be a unique feature, um, going forward. What do you think? Am I wrong? Right. I think. No, I think you're right. I think. <laughs> and I think you know what? I think that you're going to see a lot of other. Uh, editors and IDEs are going to start doing some of the same things because it makes sense. Uh, well, I think it makes sense from a size, you know, from a size point of view. Like, you know, how big is the bag? What is it? Where is it? Where where does it come from? You know, what's the size? What's the that sort of thing? And I think those particulars. Um, we've we've had on the show uh, Mark Miller. He he's a good friend of the show, and uh, he talks about uh, making. Uh, you, you know, getting things down to a science, like programming to a science, not having to wait on information to come to you, having your IDE do the work for you, and I think I think that this really speaks to that a lot too. Um, yeah, a, a little. Um, I, I, let me refine that a little bit. Uh, potentially, um, the way I think it is, <clears throat> a concept called the thinking IDE. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. The idea behind a thinking IDE or editor, you know, whatever. The idea behind the thinking IDE is that the IDE should never get in your way. That's the first and foremost, right? Never be in your way. Never format things the way you, you know, a way you don't want it. Like I didn't it. tell I you like, to do that at all. Why are you doing that? You know. <laughs> and you know, we still have we still have some things to do there, right? Obviously, it, but let's be fair. All IDEs have issues with that. Um, the the other one is if you do a you probably also want to do B. Why not let the tool give you a way to do that super easily? Right. right. So how can we get tooling to be one step ahead of you? And as you said, like let the information come to you before you need it, right? Right. Um, and those are the sort of things that... <clears throat> so we're already doing that with a lot of our stuff, especially in 2015. But I think like going forward, I think that's a general trend we're going to see, how we can see you have an error somewhere, right? Let's right. say you have a compile error or whatever. Visual Studio can actually fix those for you. Here are some common known issues with this, or here are some yeah. possible solutions. You know, yeah, try missing rotary. semicolons, yep. misspelled dim, or whatever in VB, things like that. Exactly. There's, I mean, these are so simple that even machines can fix them. Right. Yes. So why don't it? They're <laughs> misspelling right. print. Yeah. You're smart for a reason. Come on, let's 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 live up to oh, the yeah. name, right? So, um, so th that that's really awesome. So, uh, if people want to find out more information about about this, would you direct them to any particular? Because I'm a big fan of uh, Microsoft's uh, Virtual Academy uh, yeah. that they do. I'm a huge fan of that. Would you direct anybody to a particular thing to to learn more about this? Uh, yes, for this one. Uh to more in depth with like how how uh, Grunt and Galvin Visual Studio 2015 will take over uh, some of the features from Web Essentials and some of the what we talked about here today, um, go to Channel Nine, go to the Webcams TV, the latest episode which came out yesterday or today maybe yesterday, um, where I go more in depth with uh, with this topic and um, that's a really good resource. As you said, the Microsoft Virtual Academy. There was one yesterday, uh, no Monday, Monday. And so they showed off some of the new ASP.NET 5 things, the new project systems, the new uh, tooling for web developers in general. So I'm super stoked about the Apache Cordova stuff. I'm, I'm really excited yeah, so about I. that. Yeah. yeah, so we're actually working. So right now, in the preview of 2015, the whole Grunt and Bauer uh, thing doesn't light up as good in or as well in uh, in Cordova projects, but it will, right? So we're working on that. So the, <laughs> the experience that I just showed you here for web development, you can expect to see those uh, generally in all the projects. 
Oh, that's oh, great. that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, before we go any further, let me uh, let me throw out two questions. And while you're thinking about it, I'm gonna I'm gonna plug a couple of other things. Um, you, there, there's there's two uh, two questions we have, and you can pick one. What technology or programming practice do you see going extinct within the next three to five years, or uh, what's the big next uh, tech technological niche market that you see exploding within the next uh, year or so? While you're taking some time to think about that, let me tell you a little bit about. Um, our, our other shows here uh, at CodeCast. Uh, this is a part of a, a, a hydra, if you will, of a, in a non-Nazi uh, way, you know, Captain America stuff. But we're like, we're, we're a multi-headed uh, dragon here. So this is one of our shows. The other show is The Tech Informist. So if you go to thetechinformist.com, uh, you can catch all of our past episodes. We've had uh, writers of the industry from uh, Paul Thurot, Mary Jo Foley, uh, Ed Bott, all those guys uh, and gals, and, and just a, a lot of fun, a lot of good interviews. Go check that out. Also, we, if you like us uh, more local news and if you're in the St. Louis area, uh, we have STL Tech Talk. We have an STL Tech Talk podcast where we focus on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics because that's fun and that's cool and more people should be paying attention to that. Uh, we should be paying those guys uh, uh, better uh, as far as in the, the science and, and uh, engineering and mathematics department. Anyways, so uh, go check those out. Those are really, really cool. Uh, and having said that, Pluralsight is actually a sponsor of this show. So if you guys want to go out there and if you want to learn more uh, in depth uh, about uh, this a subject and other subjects like it, you can go to our website, stltechtalk.com, and click on their banner. It's in the middle of the site, and uh, get your 10-day free trial. 10 day free trial from Pluralsight. You won't be let down. Uh, so, Mads, now that we're back with you, what uh, what would you like to uh, comment on uh, out of those two questions? All right. Uh, I, I, I can do both. <laughs> Yay! Oh, look, look at that. Both of yeah. Them. Yeah, do a home run. You'll be so the I'm, first and the I'm last a, of this year. I'm a web guy, right? So I want to stick to web. Okay. <clears throat> so I think that... Um, jQuery is uh, on its way out. We still see like huge percentages of websites and developers use jQuery. Okay. Uh, but uh, most of the stuff that jQuery is used for is actually supported by browsers these days, so we don't have to use jQuery anymore as this browser abstraction layer for the different versions of the different browsers, right? Mm -hmm. um, something like the selection engine is almost uh, completely supported by like IE8 and above. So I think jQuery is going to go uh, slowly but steadily uh, out uh, in favor of just pure native JavaScript. And uh, it's not going to happen next year, right? It's going to drop. Um, I think the, the, the numbers are out for jQuery is like, it's like 80% or, yeah, 80 or something <clears throat> that you did today. But I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at like 70 or 60 by the end of uh, 2015. That's interesting. Yep. And still, there's a lot of uh, jQuery plugins, right? So mm -hmm. they have like this ecosystem that kind of slows down. The, the, you can't really move off of jQuery until you have uh, replacement for all your extensions. A nice alternative to go over to, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, Bootstrap still uses jQuery, right? So they might oh, yeah, that's that as true. well. Yeah. Um, so that's I think that's that's on its way out. Um, okay. Yeah. So and I think what's coming in. Uh, and this is also like a little bit further down the line, but we already see it starting now. It's uh, web components. Oh, okay, right. And yep. so web components is super interesting because Gus loves this stuff. <laughs> yeah, hey, me too. It's uh, stuff makes my life easier in the long run. It totally does. And hey, remember back in the good old days, or today even, like if you're a web forms uh, developer, you have this rich ecosystem of controls. Yes. And there are vendors, right? And for just accelerate and, and like NuGet and private people and you know everywhere, there's these collections of great, great controls that where you literally just put in a DLL file in your bin directory and you put in a little bit of markup, and it works. And you get like a beautiful calendar control or menu ordering system or you know mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. So yep. web components is sort of the same, and uh, based on W3C standards and um, it lets us componentize our web because the problem today is that if you write static websites, for instance, yeah, you cannot reuse anything, right? You need post uh, processing. Grunt can come in there, but you need something like Jekyll uh, to to generate your like master pages and and those sort of things, which sort of the server side languages and frameworks have, have solved for us for many years now. Um, right. In a pure client world, um, web components makes us 
makes the reusable web a reality. And um, I'm really, I'm really so happy about it. I think it's going to be so great. Uh, the tooling challenges in Visual Studio and other IDs is going to be interesting. Uh, there are some funny things, but it's fairly straightforward. Fairly straightforward if you keep to pure static uh, web um, like .html files. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know, when we mix web components with server side, we have we have a little challenge there. Uh, but it's nothing that we can't uh, uh, get around. So. I'm I'm really I'm really excited to uh, excited to start working on supporting web components fully in Visual Studio, and I hope that we can start working on it like next year. <laughs> All right, that'll yeah. that'll be actually sweet because I I can see that being kind of the n next NuGet, right? Because NuGet mm -hmm. was was that package manager that you could go grab whatever you needed. It installed all of your, your pieces, and you went. And this is just taking that, abstracting it one more layer and making it even easier to put in, right? right. Yeah, and hey, this is like NuGet, right? NuGet is great for, like, server-side assemblies, DLL mm -hmm. files and so on. Right, this is all client-side, so this would be yep. great for the Bower or NPM would probably be the main vehicles uh, or package managers for, for this type of, of widgets and control suites and so on. So... Uh, super awesome stuff. Yeah, which I think right now we're looking at Bootstrap to do a lot of that, right? Or at least on the client side. Yeah. For for widgets and and things like that. I shouldn't say the delivery of them, but the but the widgets. I know a lot of sites are using, mm. you know, directives and whatnot through Angular as well to do things like that. But I think this is uh, what you're saying is this is the next wave coming after that. And it's going to be way more powerful. Like Bootstrap sort of gives you like a few things that it does, and then it just yep. styles everything else in a certain way. Uh, yep. Here we're talking about the full Monty, like behavior, <laughs> everything, right? In one, in one that, yeah. That's that's the name of the show. Frankly, we should just oh, yeah. call it that. No, no, it's Episode it's actually going to revolutionize cool. quite a, uh, you know, the the way that I think people develop the UI. I, I think that's what what we're going to see, and I, I've I've seen some of that coming, not probably as much as you have, but that's going to be really cool. Yeah, it's really going to make a big difference in the long run. That's going to be interesting to to see, especially like you said, um, the reliance of on of Bootstrap on on jQuery going forward. So the component part is going to be uh, interesting to see what transitions there, and and then God forbid what replaces Bootstraps, right? Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, having said that. Um, uh, Mads, while we're telling everybody some happy uh, holidays and stuff like that, um, if you could think about what this next year looks like for you, where people can find you at, and that sort of thing, um, here at STL Tech, or here at STL Tech Talk, the Tech Informist uh, Codecast by STL Tech Talk, we just want to wish everybody. Uh, happy and safe holidays. Um, it's been a little crazy around where uh, me and and Kev uh, live <laughs> this past year, and it's been a little crazy all over uh, all, all over the U.S. It feels like, frankly. And um, we just hope that everybody has a, a great and just wonderful uh, holiday season. Um, I'm going to be uh, hit or miss over the next uh, uh, over the next month or so, just because of some stuff that's going on. But uh, I, I wish you and your fa family safe travels and and all the above. Uh, Gus, what do you have going on? Yeah, I've I've got nothing until next year. Um, it's going to be nice to take a few weeks off and uh, um, just kind of relax and not have to travel or do anything like that. Uh, and hit next year, next year pretty hard. I don't have anything scheduled yet, but uh, Other than um, I know CS, I'm going right? to be yeah, I'm going to be busy and and working, and uh, we'll we'll hit back uh, with the uh, codecast after the first year. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, Mads, what do you have coming up? Oh, I got like uh, two weeks, two weeks of holidays here. That's I'm looking forward to that, and then. It's it's back in the grinder. Right? We're working on getting the Angular tooling in for uh, 2015, and uh, we're going to look at uh, yeah, as I said, web components. We're going to look at uh, React JS, getting that support in. Um, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the most it's the most uh, requested feature of any web tooling in Visual Studio. So uh, we're definitely going to look at that. Um, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, Sweet. we yeah. love exclusives, man. Um, or, or, or breaking news, rather. Uh, that that's awesome. And and I want to I want to give a, a shout out to our our live audience. Uh, thank you for um, some of the the comments. I really appreciate it. Um, it makes me laugh. And uh, for uh, fans of the show, uh, stay frosty. Uh, we love you guys. Uh, also, uh, they, I just wanted to thank you again, Mads, for being a wonderful guest. And um, 
Uh, hopefully, if it, it, when this next year comes through and there's a, a, a plethora of stuff that's going to be coming out, I'm sure. You don't even need to tell me. I know it's going to be mad crazy <laughs> next year. Um, that, that I didn't mean the pun, but eh, it fits. So um, so we'd like to have you back on, um, and, and we just really appreciate everybody listening, and we appreciate you being on and, and all that. It, it really it means the world to us. Um, so, uh, Gus, did you have anything you wanted to add to the end of this wonderful episode, the, sir? The, the only thing I wanted to do is say thanks, Mads, for coming on the show. I, I know your time is valuable, and you're busy in your, your daily role, and, and we appreciate you coming on and showing some of the new things that are coming down and a, and a little bit of an exclusive of there about React JS uh, being uh, supported in the uh, editors and the IDE. So, uh, not to mention the fact that I've loved a lot of the stuff that you've done in the past. The blogengine.net I, I actually ran myself, um, and and uh, uh, Web Essentials that I can't live without. So, thank you for all the good work that you've done for us developers and made it and making it much easier for us to do what we do every day. Thanks, man, and hey, thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. It was great, and uh, hey, anytime. Anytime. Anytime you want me back, I'm ready. Okay. That's cool, Sounds man. Uh, there you go. That's appreciate awesome. that. that. That's my Christmas gift. So uh, so thank you again, Matt, for being on the show. And to all of our fans, we love and thank you for your support of the show. So from the entire CodeCast crew, good coding. We're out.